Welcome to our lesson this morning, lesson number three, the law as teacher. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you, Renier. It's a blessing to be here again. Welcome to all our viewers. And as we start, please just pray for us. Sure, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you love us with an everlasting love. And that your will is that none should be lost, but all may be saved in your kingdom. I pray you bless us as we study this important subject on obedience to you as a result of the love relationship that you desire each one of your children to experience with you. Bless all our viewers, bless Renir and myself with your spirit. Guide us and lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our theme text is Deuteronomy 6.5. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And what we're going to look at in this study is the law as the teacher, what the Ten Commandments can educate us in, or the law in its totality, especially what we can learn from what Moses wrote um, to the Israelites. So this would be our study today. I like that they added Galatians 3.21. It says, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been given by the law or been by the law. So one thing we need to understand is that the law cannot give us righteousness. The law cannot save us. But when we follow the law by God's grace and through his power, righteousness is the result. You will do that which is right, which the law is asking us to do. So let's start with to love and to fear God. So Moses is talking to the Israelites and he says to them, let's read especially Deuteronomy 31 verse 12 and 13. Deuteronomy 31, 12 and 13. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. So here we see that the law actually leads people to fear God. It enables and empowers them so that you come to the place that you fear him. Brian, how can we understand this in relation to fearing the Lord? And also I want to put it in the end time context where Revelation 14 tells us at the end of time, there's a message that goes to all the world saying, fear God and give glory to him. So as you look in all of scripture, when it speaks of fearing the Lord, it's, it's not in the context to be in afraid as being afraid of him. Mm. Or being terrified by him. Although that, that was the, the natural result um, when someone had an encounter with God that we call an epiphany. Um, when, when Moses saw the burning bush, he was afraid and God had to speak to him. Now, even when uh, men had an encounter with angels, as John did, as Gabriel did, as, as Daniel did with Gabriel. Um, but especially when they came into the presence of the Lord, uh, though God had uh, always would say, do not be afraid. And the angel always would say, do not be afraid, as with uh, salutation to Mary and to Elizabeth, etc., etc. So we understand then that the fear, the true fear in the Bible is to love God, is to mm. respect and obey God. And, and, and that's why uh, the... Psalmist would say, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what is this wisdom? That we would be obedient to God in all of his requirements. And, and, and that's what it's all about, uh, Renier. So, yes, there's also an aspect that we should fear God in terms of, you know, if we don't obey him, then, um, you know, there's nothing but a fearful end for all those who do not obey the gospel. Mm. There's destruction coming. So, so we should certainly fear, but that's not the reason why we serve God. We serve God because we love God. Yes, yeah, so the, love is the catalyst for the fear. It is, right. And it's, as you say, it's, it's a reverence. 
it's not a, oh, I'm afraid of God, even though we should be. You know, this is yeah. almighty God. But that's not his goal. That's not what he wants for us. He wants us to reverence him as the almighty creator in love. And I like what Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13 says. If people talk about fearing God, these are the texts I always go to. Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? Mm -hmm. Now Moses is going to explain what that looks like. To walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command you today for your good. So it is to walk with God. It is to love God. It is to stand in his service and reach souls for his kingdom. To, right. to keep his commandments, what he tells us, what he guides us in, everything that he commands us to walk in it. That's what it means to fear God in love. Amen. That, Let me just the add there, the... the uh... The wisest man, Solomon, that lived in the Old Testament said that, uh, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, mm. the sum of life. Uh, fear God and do what? Keep all Keep his commandments. All... This is the whole duty of men. The whole duty of men. Why? Because God is going to bring every work into judgment. Every secret thing. So, so that's God's will for us that we would love him, that we'll be obedient. That's the will of you as a parent. You and mm. Chantel are extremely excited when your boys obey you out of the heart and choose rather than to be threatened. Well, if you continue, you know, um, I'm going to have to take you to the room uh, yes. and discipline you. No, uh, a parent does it out of love anyhow to get the response of love. So, mm -hmm. so I think of it this way. Yeah. The Apostle Paul says, I think it's in First Timothy, Second Timothy 1 verse 7. He says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but yes. of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hmm. If you think about the, the, the experience of Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God, um, he said, I was naked and afraid. Yes. And that's why I hid from God. So, so sin leads us to hide from God, separate from God, be fearful and afraid of God. But the love of Christ, Paul says, uh, constrains us, draws us to God. And, and, and we, we feel uh, committed. We feel encouraged we feel fulfilled we feel protected in that kind of relationship that leads to obedience from you yes so the law wants to teach us to fear god that's the first right. point as the mm -hmm. the court is all about education this is what the law does fear god mm -hmm. and live his life then a witness against you which is building upon this fact and this is where moses wrote the book of the law and he put it on the side of the ark and he said, it's there as a witness against you. And mm -hmm. in these texts, you can also see that God says to him, call Joshua and let I anoint him to take your place as leader. Moses then writes the words in the book. He speaks the words so that the people may fear God again. The book of the law. Now, Brian. Why is, was this important for Moses to do just before he died? Why, why would he take these steps? As we look at uh, the, the actual book that Moses wrote, Deuteronomy, it means the repetition of the legislation. Mm -hmm. So, of course, in Exodus was the first uh, presentation of the legislation, God's law. But in Deuteronomy, this is now some almost 40 years after Exodus. And we know what happened. Moses and uh, Aaron had transgressed the law of God. They were to speak to the rock at uh, Kadesh Banya and not to strike the rock. Mm. And uh, they were not to take any credit for God's um, work. Remember they said, ye come here, ye rebels, must we fetch you water? And instead of speaking to the rock in anger, Moses strikes the rock um, more than once as well. But the point is this year, they were him and his brother were told by God, because of that, you would not cross over into the promised land. So here they are, when this chapter is written, uh, uh, they are on the borders of Canaan after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and they're about to cross over, and God says to Moses, listen, you're not going to cross over. Um, Joshua is now going to take your place, and I want you to give him a charge. And it's interesting, as we look at the study, the charge that Joshua was given by Moses through God, 
uh, which was to be obedient to all the Lord has commanded him. Mm. So, so, so here is this situation where God is saying this book of the law is going to be a witness against you when you are disobedient. Because if you read in Deuteronomy 27, 28, you've got the curses, you've got the blessings. If you are obedient mm. to God, there were so many blessings. If you were disobedient, there was the curses. Uh, um, but, but God wanted them to choose the way of life, to walk in his commandments, to be obedient to him. And so Moses reiterates God's covenant promises and all that he had done for the children of Israel. And he's trying to encourage them, listen, as you go into this new land that God's given to you, he is going to give you the land. And you need to realize that you owe your existence to God and God wants you to remain in a covenant relationship of obedience, which is motivated by love. And as long as you do that, you are going to be happy, holy, healthy, and you are going to be fulfilled in life. But when you disobey, this book of the law will be a witness against them. And of course, God's desire was not for them to experience the blessings, I mean, sorry, the curses that would come from disobedience. Yeah, so this book was basically a reminder of the law of God, more than right. just the law of God. The feasts were also contained in this book. And this That's is what right. Colossians 2 especially talks about. That was the handwriting of ordinances that was against Israel. It was nailed to the cross. And right. inside of this book also, it's almost like God was saying to them, listen here, this is what sin looks like if mm -hmm. you do not follow. And it gave them a knowledge of sin through this book. And the New Testament reiterates this in Romans chapter 3. And I also like what Paul says in Galatians where he says, The law is your schoolmaster that mm. led you unto Christ. It was the one that was teaching you what is right and what is wrong. But you yourself cannot keep it. You yourself cannot want to do it. Your desires is evil continually. And you need right. Christ as your savior by faith to empower you to keep this in the end of the day. So this is what Moses was trying to say to them. Like you guys are rebelling while I'm alive. You are certainly going to rebel when I'm dead. So here mm. is what's showing you the requirements of God, lest you forget. And there's this popular story in the old Testament where the book of the law was found. Finally, it was read and all the people repented because mm. of what was written in the book of the law. So, so Ramir, I just wanted to add to that. Um, when you look at um, uh, when the commandments were given, uh, Jesus himself, of course, came down, the pre-incarnate Christ on Mount Sinai and gave it to Moses, who gives it to the children of Israel. And, and when he reads out the law, he says, they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do. I mean, they were being boastful. Um, and saying that, okay, we will do it. They could not do it in their own strength. They should have rather said, all that the Lord has said, we cannot do but for his grace. And, and that's the same thing today when it comes to the moral law. Um, I like the way our Paul says it, that uh, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And by that, he means Christ is the, the aim. Yes. Uh, Christ is the mark when it comes to the law because he kept the law perfectly on our behalf, and that through him, we too might be obedient to all of God's commandments. And um, I, I, I really love the way how David puts it in Psalm 19. He says, he mentions the different ways of expressing the law. He says, the law of the Lord God is perfect, converting the soul. Then he says, the testament, in other words, for the law is, is um, making wise the simple. Then he says, the statutes of the Lord are right and rejoicing the heart. And he says, the commandments of the Lord uh, is enlightening the eyes. And so he goes on using Hebrew parallelism to, to explain the law in different aspects in how it is a safeguard for us between God and our fellow men. And that's what is the glue that holds the relationship motivated by love. I like that text in Romans chapter 10 where it says um, the law as the, is the end. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, many people with that mean that, that that means that Christ has made an end to the law. But that word end in the Greek is telos, where we get the word telescope from. So it's mm -hmm. the one that magnifies Christ that you need. Right. 
So that's basically the function. When you show you your sin, it points you and leads you to Christ, your schoolmaster. The beauty of the, t- as you have said in Deuteronomy, um, it says all the blessings when you mm. obey God's commandments. You know, sometimes when God blesses, you almost feel guilty that God is blessing a person so much. And I'm like, yo, you know, it's not like I'm a perfect human being and there's a, ble- you know, my marriage is going well, etc. You got all these blessings. And you sometimes feel guilty, like you're happy and other people aren't happy in, in whatever sphere it is, let's say your marriage. Mm. But this is the promise if you obey God's law. For he said in Joshua 1, 7 and 8, and I just want to reiterate, God's blessings isn't always material, as in financially. Right. It can be in other aspects, health, your marriage, your children. Where you're staying, you might be in the country with not a lot of money, but you are blessed by God. So let's read Joshua 1, 7 and 8. It says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So, Brian, how should we understand this prospering, this good success? Is it just financially? You know, what what is this, or are there other aspects to it? So, it's a lot more deeper than uh, any financial benefit or any material benefit, because when we think about the life of a Christian. Um, and it's so aptly put in Hebrews chapter 11, all those who are obedient to God, beginning with Abel, who offered the righteous offering that, that God ex- re- required for atonement, um, for Abram, for Moses, for all those listed there, um, they looked for a city whose maker, uh, who, uh, they looked for a city whose foundations and builder or maker is God. So when you look at, um, God's desire for us is to be eternally in a relationship with him that is only in love. And that was shattered by sin in the Garden of Eden. So throughout the chapters of the Bible, from chapter, Genesis chapter 3 onwards, right up when we get to Revelation chapter 21, where the new earth and the new heavens and God is back in a perfect communion and perfect uh, relationship with his creation, his children. Um, it is God pursuing mankind for his benefit. So, so what we have on this earth is just a short, it's, it's like a vapor, uh, Isaiah says. Life is like a vapor. We're here today, we're not here tomorrow. Uh, mm-hmm. And the point is, if we will be obedient to God, not everyone who is obedient to God has life that is going to be good and go well. In fact, Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 24, that you will be hated of all men for mine's sake. Uh, you shall be killed. You'll be brought before uh, judges. You will be put in prison. Um, and all these kind of things will happen. So, so we need to realize in the context of the great controversy, God saying to us, listen, I'm going to bless you with eternal life. Mm-hmm. And so even though your life may end like John the Baptist in a terrible way and be beheaded. Uh, yet for him, a crown of life was waiting. <laughs> uh, Paul went through all the calamities of taking the gospel to the world. And he said, listen, I was in prisons. I was in beatings. I was in cold and hunger. I was mocked. Uh, I was almost left for dead. I was stoned twice. He went through all these difficulties for God. But he says, I I count it but dung for the knowledge uh, of God in Christ Jesus. Everything he went through in this life, he says, I consider my sufferings to be of nothing. In fact, he says that the glory of God may be revealed in me. So he he could say at the end of his life, you know, I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've run the race. For me, there's a crown of life awaiting for me and for all those who love the Lord. So they look to the future. And that's what God wants us to do, to look to the future in a world without the blight and the curse of sin and death. 
Mm. This is what I like about the Bible. When God says you would prosper, you will have success. Number one, he's, what he's meaning is you will prosper spiritually. Right. In my character that you're representing to the world. You would prosper if you obey my commandments and in the way that I will tell you to walk in reaching other people for my kingdom. You would mm. prosper emotionally. You'd be stable in me because I will teach you my ways. These are the main ways that God wants you to prosper first. And then he says, I will add anything else unto you, which you can handle. So some he would give more and some he would get left. And that's not listed to talking about financially, etc. But spiritually, all are on the same playing field to prosper. Reaching right. souls, understanding the word of God, having, having his wisdom. These are the things that God is saying would be in your way. It, it's what Joseph had in Egypt. Yes, he prospered too, becoming second in charge when it comes to financial gain, etc. But it was the wisdom that God gave him in which he prospered that led him to that place. The same Amen. with Daniel. First prospering spiritually, interpreting the dream before the king says, well, I need you as my number one minister. Mm -hmm. And then he had the position, the finances, etc. And that's exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 6. When he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his character, mm -hmm. and everything else will be added. What you need in your circumstances. So when I think about the Beatitudes, uh, Renir, as you're talking, uh, God said, blessed are they um, who seek the kingdom of heaven. For, for, for those who seek the kingdom of heaven, for them, the, 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 the blessings of knowing that you in God's will is going to be realized. Blessed are they when men persecute you for my name's sake. And that word blessing means blessed is happy. So, so we can be happy when we are reviled for God's sake. We can be happy even when we are hungry and thirsting. We, we can be happy as long as we are in God's will. And he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So God always looked at the material benefits to be of the least importance. Like the scribes and Pharisees thought material benefits were the first importance where God says, seek me first, as you mentioned there in Matthew 6, uh, 33. Seek me first and the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then I'll add these things onto you. So mm -hmm. a man's life does not consist in the things that he has, Jesus said, but uh, those who will lose his life shall gain it. In other words, what you have in this life here is going to be so short. It's important to prepare for the life to come that is eternity. And I think this lays a good foundation for Wednesday's part of the lesson that says the toils and struggles of law keepers. Doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle in this life. You'll prosper spiritually. It doesn't mean you won't have trials. You won't have any of these things. As Second Chronicles 31, 13, 21 talks about King Hezekiah prospering because he kept God's commandments. He followed what mm. God said. But then disaster strikes many times for Christians, Brian. Why is that? If we are keeping God's law to the best of our ability, if we are allowing Jesus to work in our life, why then do bad things still happen to good people? Yeah, that's, that's one of the big five questions, Renir. And uh, I always like to answer that uh, in the life of Jesus Christ. Because he said the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. And if you look at how they treated Jesus, how he was uh, misaligned, how he was misquoted, how he was framed and eventually killed on a cruel cross. You know, Jesus said, this is going to be the lot because of, of his followers, because we have an enemy who is working very hard to destroy our faith. And, and when you look at... Um, the commandments that uh, Jesus speaks of, he says, I have kept my father's commandments. And for his life, because it showed the contrast between the pretentious life of the scribes and Pharisees, he was, I mean, what's his name? Caiaphas said, it's expedient that one man should perish and the nation be saved. Okay, he said that in selfishness, but he was actually... Uh, proclaiming a profound truth that mm. Jesus would be, as Daniel had prophesied in Daniel 9, 27, he would be cut off 
not for himself, but for his people. So here is Jesus' life sacrifice for all. So this is the struggle that we all will have to face. And as we look at um, the struggles that we face, we can be able to be overcomers as Jesus was an overcomer. So, so I believe this is the, the path that uh, all of us uh, need to realize that we are going to face. I think it is Apostle Peter that said that we ought to endure hardness as a soldier of the cross. Uh, too often we want to be in charge, in control, and be comfortable. And yet um, Jesus will afflict the comfortable and he will comfort the afflicted. So it, it is God's desire that like those who are under the third angel's message, which we are living in this time here, that we would be obedient to God and to all his commandments and have the faith of Jesus. But, but we look at the struggle in Revelation 12, 17, the devil is angry. He is wroth with the, the remnant of the seed of the woman, the church. And what does he do? He goes out to make war against them who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So this is the battle. And until God delivers his people in the book of Revelation after the seven plagues, then, then we can say, God, we are now ready to be in the kingdom with you because soon it will be over and we are with God. That is so true. And what I like about what the lesson refers to is John the Baptist story. Jesus mm. said, the greatest prophet that this world has ever seen, with the most important message that this world has ever seen in that time, I believe we've got an important message here at the end, another Elijah message. And Jesus yes. said, there's never been someone like him. And he's lost his head in prison. And while he was in prison, he said, is this the son of man? Or are we looking for someone else? This is after he baptized Jesus, seeing the heavens open, the Holy Spirit right. descending like a dove and hearing the voice. The other thought it was thunder, but he heard the voice saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So there's no doubt it is the son of God from John's perspective. That's right. what he heard. So it just shows that even John, the great John the Baptist went through trials. But mm. if you know this, the history of Ellen G. White, she struggled with her health her whole life. That's right. Yet many of us would say, wow, what an amazing relationship she must have had with God, seeing Christ, listening to him, etc. She struggled with her health. She lost mm. her two sons. If you think of Job's story, Job losing everything. So God yeah. has never said that we will have a struggle-free life. It's not in the scriptures. The yeah. other side is actually in the scriptures where men struggled and failed over and over again. And it's written mm -hmm. for a reason so that you and I can see it is through much suffering we need to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus himself, which is our example on Thursday's lesson, he himself suffered through obedience, Hebrews 5 mm -hmm. and 8, but through right. that he was perfected. Because the devil mm. is real. There's no question about it. The devil's goal is to seek, destroy. But Christ has come that we may have a life and more abundantly, spiritually, more abundantly. that is. Yeah, spiritually, sure. Spiritually. But we have the knack to first look at materially or physically. You know, if all of those things prosper, then I'm happy. But what I don't understand, without Jesus, if those things happen, my life falls apart. But with Jesus, when those things happen, it's still hard, but my life doesn't have to fall apart. I can walk with Christ. Now, Brian? So let me add, there. Let me add yes. on to that, Renee. Um, I was just thinking about this here. Um, you know, the, the statement Ellen White says that trials, difficulties are God's tools mm. in which he wants to perfect our characters and to smoothen off the rough edges. Um, so, so we go through trials because God allows trials to cause us to look up to him so that we might, through his power, be more than conquerors. We can overcome as he overcame. So, so, so Ellen White, commenting on the experience of, of John the Baptist, says that all who follow the Lord will go through disappointments. Mm. Um, and, and, and finally, when John got the message from Jesus, his faith soared. And he recognized that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm going to accept whatever lot he allows for me. Uh, when you think of Elijah, 
running away from Jezebel after God had said, listen, you know, I'm going to use you to deliver uh, Israel. Um, he was fearful and suicidal. But God sent an angel there to give him not only heavenly food, but to encourage him to persist in the battle because we're fighting against an enemy who's relentless. Satan does not give up. He's continually bombarding. And every time we think, you know, we, we've, we've gained a victory and then we relax, he comes and then, you know, next thing we are taken in temptation. So God wants us all. That's why he says, watch and pray. We always ought to be looking unto Jesus, the author now, finish our faith. We we'll always be asking to encourage us when we face trials, that through these trials, we may come out stronger than we were before. Because he promises that he'll go through the fire with us. He will not leave us nor forsake us. So we can always be encouraged by the many wonderful promises that God has for us when we face difficulties. Amen. And the beauty is that Jesus was our example. Again, Amen. he right. walked the road. The, the lesson gives us Luke 2, 51 and 52. He, John 8, 28 and 29. Let's read that. John 8, 28 and 29. That's a good text. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me, I speak these things. Mm. And he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So in the context of pleasing God, doing his will, Jesus said, I would suffer greatly. I would be nailed to the cross. Brian, how can we be comforted by the fact that if we obey God's commandments, if we have the law as our teacher, to guide us to Jesus or to the Father, that through Jesus' example and his obedience, I can take comfort in my trials and my struggles. I think Jesus summed it up succinctly and so well when he said, you know, I have kept my Father's uh, commandments and abide in his will. And then he says to his disciples in John 14, 15, and it's for you and I today as God's disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. So obedience uh, is the result of the grace of God in you and I to please God. Because uh, it's God's will that we obey Him. And, and, and that's going to be the test for all in the last days in which we are living in. In fact, the Laodicean promise is uh, in Revelation 3 verse 20, 21, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my Father's throne. Um, so we can be overcomers. In fact, the promise is, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So, so as we go through these experiences with the, with the Lord, our faith becomes stronger. Think of the disciples. Think of the apostle Paul. As they went through the struggles and the battle uh, with the enemy, they came out stronger until to them, life was not important as being obedient to God and to his will and to do and carry out the mission of Christ. Because Christ said, I will be with you. I will never leave you, forsake you. Even when they were facing the ex executioner's uh, stake, um, they had no fear because they had done the will of God. And for them, the next moment would be the resurrection when they are with Jesus and the saved. So that's how you know God wants us to be encouraged as we have our difficulties in life because we, we don't like difficulties. And by the way, mm -hmm. you know, I always say to people, let's not put ourselves in a place to invite difficulties and trials. Yes. Let's be obedient to God and avoid confrontation. But when it comes where we've got to stand for truth as the three Hebrew boys had to stand, you know, mm -hmm. then now, you know, you can do as you want. For me, I will serve the Lord. And, yes. and that's how God would have us be. So Jesus was our example of perfect obedience and he suffered right. as a perfect human being. So God has never promised, as I said before, that we won't go through trials, etc. But we can take courage in Christ that his example has paved the way that so many people in the New Testament, so many during the dark ages, have rested mm. in Jesus when they've gone through great trials and God has brought them through and they will receive the crown of life. So will we if we hold on to Christ, no matter what, let the Lord be our teacher. Let the Amen. Lord teach us of God's ways and his will. 
And may we abide in that will by through love and see what God will do through you. Stop trying making excuses for not keeping God's law by holding on to things that is unnecessary. Hold on to Jesus and his commandments. And really, trust me, I've seen his hand move in my life. When I choose to obey him, I don't have the power to do it, but he does. I make the choice, he empowers me. He cannot empower me without making a choice. For love is a choice. That's what I believe the lesson is. When you drop me. Uh, Rainier, I, I, I remember reading a statement from Ellen White that says, obedience is the highest form of worship. Mm. And so, um, so God wants us to have that kind of experience. So when you think about the law, it doesn't just point out sin. It points out God's righteousness, God's character. And um, as you read in Psalm 119, it's right in the middle of the Bible, that entire Psalm is about the blessings that comes from obedience to God's commandments. And, um, you know, for those who find fault with the law, it is usually because there's some sin in their lives that mm -hmm. they uh, don't like the fact that the law is pointing. But we always need to recognize that the law points us to Jesus Christ. It points out sin and then takes us back to Jesus, that he's the only answer to our sin, and then sent, Jesus sends us back the law. If you love me, keep my commandments. So there's total harmony there in God's grace, saving us from sin. And then, of course, in obedience, which is power over sin. Amen. Brian, thank you so much for joining in this lesson. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I Amen. pray that for the viewers, that you would listen to the appeal and that your heart would be open to obey God's commandments and let Christ teach you through his law. Let's just end off in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this lesson that you have given to, to show us that the law also educates us. Mm. To go to Christ for him we need. I pray that you would help us in everything that we go through. Teach us your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.